Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Cottage Kitchen at the Elliott Homestead. We are going to make something so special today. Maybe some of you have watched, there's an old series, uh, I think it was part of the BBC. There's Victorian Farm, Edwardian Farm, Wartime Farm, and there are these wonderful old fashioned series of three historians who go back and live a calendar year as if it was the Victorian times or the Edwardian times. It's absolutely wonderful and was very impactful for me when I was learning how to do a lot of these things that we do now, like cooking from scratch. So today we're gonna to be making kind of a traditional Victorian Christmas meat pie. I'm gonna be teaching you how to make a hot water crust pastry, which is a very old fashioned dough. It's a lot of fun. It even feels good in your hands like a grown up Play-Doh. And I'm gonna be teaching you how to use an inexpensive cut of meat to make something that's just absolutely wonderful. So if you're feeding crowds for the holidays or you just wanna put some beautiful dish as the centerpiece for your table, this is what you should make. As always, if you want to learn more about cooking from scratch recipes that are inspired by not only what we grow here on our farm, but by what other farmers grow really well, there's gonna be a link below the video to join our cooking community and we would love to see you over there. Our inexpensive cut that doesn't get enough screen time in my opinion is the good old fashioned chuck roast. So this is a cut of meat that comes from typically a steer's kind of shoulder area. And if you think about a quadruped animal, they're walking on all four of their legs, right? And the shoulders take a lot of beating during their life. So they're typically tough. They need to be slow cooked because that muscle has just been used a lot. This is why you get discrepancies in how you need to cook uh, different cuts of meat because the loin, for example, gets almost no exercise. It's not used, so it's not as strong, it's not as tough. Something like the chuck roast needs to be slow cooked. But even in that case, we're gonna be cutting it up and cooking it fairly quickly. So this is a beautiful chuck roast from Porter Road. Like I said, it's a very economical cut of meat, so it's a great one for you to learn how to use. Today's video, by the way, is sponsored by Porter Road. I'm gonna be talking a lot about them in the video because I'm really excited about what they're doing as a company. I know a lot of you who are enjoying this channel aren't farming your own animals for meat. So what happens then when you want high quality pasture raised roasts and whole chickens, dry aged steaks and beautifully cured hams? This is why I am so grateful to introduce you to Porter Road. Even here where we produce a lot of our own meat, we are still in need of certain cuts for certain holidays or events, or just to fill holes in the freezer for products we don't raise ourselves. Simply put, Porter Road checks all of my quality standards with zero compromises. What founders Chris and James are doing here, from the animal husbandry standards, which I care a lot about, to the food standards and their chefs, so they care a lot about that. It's absolutely top of the line. I genuinely cannot recommend their meat products highly enough to you. Visit porterroad.com forward slash the Elliott Homestead to get 15% off your first order. Okay. So here is my beautiful chuck roast. Like I've said before, grating meat was something that I did, learned how to do in school. And if you look at this piece of meat, this chuck roast, you'll see all these little kind of white squiggle marks. That's intermuscular fat, and that's a very wonderful thing because fat is flavor. And so this is something that you do look for when you're looking at a cut of meat. Now, typically if this were in a steak, that would be really good news, that would be kind of pushing it towards like a prime level, which is like a high, wonderful grating of meat. In a chuck roast, people don't think about it like that because like I said, chuck roasts need to be slow cooked, but that is going to keep our meat from drying out. So that's a really good thing to see. Something else you'll see on Porter Road packages is the label dry aged. Well, what does that mean? This is a great thing for you to know as the consumer because it does affect the price of the meat. After the animal is slaughtered, it is left to hang, the carcass is left to hang in a cool room, such as a refrigerator, meat locker, for a varying amount of days. And what this does is it actually evaporates water from the surface of the muscles, the meat that we're going to eat, so that you're not paying for water weight. So you're gonna see dry aged meat that's a little bit more per pound. This is partly because it takes a little bit more time, more hands-on, but also because 
that's going to concentrate that meat down. So it is going to have a more concentrated flavor. Dry aging is something that we do with all of our animals that we butcher here. We put them down into the cold room and we let them hang sometimes for two, three weeks if we can. And it's just a really wonderful way to sort of concentrate those flavors in the meat. You're going to get a better meat when you dry age something and you're gonna be cooking off a lot less water. So everything that you cook from it is going to have more flavor. Flavor is what we want. So we're going to attack this beautiful beast of a chuck roast. Now, obviously this is a big cut of meat. You could certainly cut it in half and do half of it. So all of this beautiful fat, you guys, I wanna cry when I see people cutting fat off of meat. Fat is what we need. Fat is solid nutrition for our body. And you know what? Meat kind of gets this rap for being expensive, right? We think of um, we think of it as this luxury, but the reality is the price of meat per pound with nutritionally what you get from it is exponentially better than say for rice. You would have to eat so much rice to get nutritionally what you can get from just a little bit of meat. So it might seem a little counterintuitive, but meat is actually very economical to eat. So you can stop buying cereal and potato chips and instead just invest in a nutrition powerhouse. All right, now look at this beautiful meat. Isn't that wonderful? Look at all this beautiful intermuscular fat. Sometimes I get asked the question, well, why do you bring in cuts of meat? Don't you raise your own? And the answer is yes, we do. We raise a lot of our own meat here on the farm, but that's not conducive for everybody. Obviously, everybody's not gonna go start a farm and start butchering their own animals, nor is it in everybody's capacity to be able to have a bunch of freezers for preserving that meat, or even having the means to buy half a steer or a whole steer of a quarter of a steer all at one time. And even now with the amount of meat that we produce on our farm, we still need particular cuts for particular things. So we might need a chuck roast, for example, when we have company coming over and maybe we've eaten all of our chuck roasts. Or we want bacon or we want sausage. So it's a great way to kind of fill in those gaps and you know, kind of meet people's needs where they're at with what they need. I'm kind of, um, getting chatty about this meat, but I'm really passionate about meat production. I'm really, really passionate about the way that animals are raised and the way that we can use this incredible resource in a responsible way. I'm going to put a link below the video to a wonderful article on Porter Road and kind of really how they're reimagining the supply chain from the animal's birth to ultimately that ending up on our plate. There is a really beautiful and responsible way for us to do this that makes it sustainable. Something I get, I got goosebumps now. It's something I get really, really excited about, obviously. Okay, look at this beautiful, beautiful chuck roast. This is going to offer so much nourishment and it's gonna be really fun to make. All right, you've got your cut up chuck roast. It's dry aged, it's full of fat, full of flavor, full of wonderful things. What do you want it to taste like? When I think of a beautiful Christmassy meat pie, I think of very warming spices. So I'm going to be seasoning my chuck roast. Well, we'll start with a good bit of salt. Salt and pepper, can't go wrong with that, except I'm out of pepper. So we'll add in what we have. There we go. All right, now I'm gonna be adding in um, maybe a politically incorrect medley of spices. This is a Bulgarian warming spice. It's a blend that I have um, that has some cumin and coriander. Really wonderful. Um, this, is some, <laughs> this is some Thai curry, which has a little bit of heat, which also has really wonderful flavor. And you know what? I hope this goes to show you, you don't need to take your food that seriously. I take food probably seri more serious than the average person. And look what I'm doing. I'm not measuring. I'm putting flavors together that I know go well together. You, um, this is, by the way, is shawarma, which is a wonderful spice that my friend Sarah brings back for me when she visits her mom in Israel. It's warming. It smells like coriander and cumin and paprika. You could use herb de, herbs de Provence. You could use just like an Italian spice blend. You could just use cumin and coriander and chili powder. You can use whatever spices you like. You could keep it really simple with just sage and salt and pepper. But the idea is just that we're gonna season our meat really well. I have 
my Dutch oven back here. I'm going to heat up some butter because we're going to just sort of sear this meat. What that does is it seals the edges and it holds that moisture in so that all that intermuscular fat that we looked at before can just hang out in there and render this meat nice and tender. Time is your friend. You're going to let time do all the work for you here. So put your oven on low, like 250. We're gonna sear the meat, put the lid on the Dutch oven, and then it's just gonna tuck into the oven for two or three hours until those pieces of meat just fall apart tender. So again, if I'm not taking all this time talking to my camera, this could be done in five minutes. It could be in the oven, cooking away slowly while I finish schooling the kids. Okay, let's go. sprinkle in just a little bit of flour, which is gonna help turn all of that fat and that beautiful meat juice into a gravy inside of our pie, which is exactly what we want. So once the meat is nice and seared and just sort of colored on all sides, I'll stir it a few times. You could add in a cup of wine, red wine, white wine, or even just a chicken stock or beef stock, just to give it a little bit of liquid, which is going to help it render nice and soft and wonderful. So little flour, some sort of little liquid, and it'll go right into the oven. This next part is going to go very quickly. You've already done the super hard work and taken five minutes of getting that chuck roast in the oven, letting time do the work for you and rendering an inexpensive, otherwise tough piece of meat into something absolutely wonderful. I did that last night so that we could move through this a little swifter together today. So I have my beautiful chuck roast and it's ready to go into a meat pie. So let's make our hot water pastry. I have 900 grams of flour in here. That's about two pounds of flour. And to that, I'm going to add a cup of boiling water. This is hot water after all. So in it goes. You need hot water. Hot, hot, hot. And now we're gonna add 350 grams of melted fat. Butter, lard, tallow, duck fat, all wonderful and very traditional options. I'm going to be using tallow today which is rendered down beef fat. Sometimes I like to play this game in my mind where I think about nutritionally what certain foods would have meant to peoples over time. Like if you were out in the wilderness, right? And you happened upon a cabin and they had a homemade meat pie calorically, what that would mean to you in terms of survival would just be massive. Okay. Now this is very hot, you can mix it by hand, but I'm gonna go ahead and use my mixer. We're gonna knead it until it's nice and smooth. It's gonna take on a wonderful texture. Oops. Need to mix it just a little bit more here. You can see I have a few dry pockets, which is fine. It's nice and warm on my hands, which is exactly what we need. I'm going to separate off about a third of it and that's gonna be for my lid for the top of my pie. And then the bottom two thirds, I love this about parchment paper where you can just, I know it's noisy, but you can kind of use it to knead dough on itself. No dry pockets allowed. It just takes on that hot fat so well, it's really beautiful. I think it's really beautiful. Okay, so this still feels nice and warm, which is great. And I'm going to roughly roll it into a circle because I'm going to be using a circle pan. You would need to adjust depending on how you're going to do yours. Now this isn't going to transfer perfect, but the great thing about this pastry is it's really forgiving. So you can kind of mold it and squish it around with your hands as you need to. It's meant to be 
thicker. It's not meant to be as thin as a pie crust because like I said, it's meant so that the pie can be freestanding. So we're gonna try to kind of roll this up and just transfer it over. It's not gonna go super well. That's okay, don't panic. There we go, don't break. All right, now see how I've kind of misjudged? That's all right, I can literally tear off the sides and patch them in on the other side, just like so. And you know what, at the end of it, it's gonna look very homemade and like farm food, like it was made on a farm by people who love to do things with their hands. So I'm trying to just kind of use my fingers to gauge thickness. As with all things, the more you do this, the better at it you're gonna get. But the best part about this though, is that it feels really fun to play with. So I'm kind of using my fingers to squish up the sides of my mold so that my bottom's not too thick. Give my sides a little structure too. And then we'll try and even it out so we don't have any pockets where that yummy gravy can leak out. All right, that's beautiful. I'm quite happy with it. Okay, so I have my meat filling. Like I said, make this the night before. You can have that bit totally ready. And you know what? If you don't wanna do meat, you could certainly fill this with cooked potatoes and carrots and celery. Um, to my inside, just to give it a little bit more flavor, we wanna add an acid because that cuts all that beautiful fat that we have going on here. So I'm gonna stir in a little container of creme fraiche, which is kind of like a mild sour cream. And it's just gonna give us that little hit of acid and that little hit of a creamy note, which is really wonderful. Okay. In she goes. This just makes me kind of feel old fashioned in a really wonderful way even doing this. You could add veg to this. You could add chopped kale, frozen peas, spinach, all kinds of options. That's gonna be so good. All right, we're almost there. You've done a great job so far. I mean, this is just pounds, pounds of nutrition. And I love that because I'm not interested in food that really doesn't do anything for you, nutritionally, calorically. All right, so here is my lid. This is a fun bit, set that aside. And make ourselves a little lid. So again, I'm gonna go for the circle here. Okay, here's our beautiful lid. It's gonna go over our meat pie. We'll transfer it just the same way. Roll it up on our pin. And over our pie, like so. So what we wanna do now is just pinch off. Let me move this out the way. Pinch this off so we have a really nice clean edge and so they're sealed. So first I'm gonna do is press around the edge to press them together so that all of our juices don't come spilling out the top. It's amazing to me what the hands can learn to do. You ever watch somebody knit who's very competent? I knit, I am not competent at all, but Getting to watch hands, you know, it could be a builder, it could be somebody chopping wood, it could be somebody just riding a horse, like where their hands just know what to do. And you think, gosh, how many hours of investment did that person make into being able to do that? All right, I'm literally pinching off with the palm of my hand, all of my extra. I know it's nice and sealed. Now my dough is starting to cool down, so it's becoming less and less smooth as I work with it which is fine because we're almost done. How fun is this? 
Okay, I have just a little bit of dough left. And so for the fun of it, you'll notice as the dough warms up, or as the dough cools down rather, and it's not as hot anymore, it's not quite as smooth, starts to dry out very quickly. But I'm gonna cut out some little hearts. You could decorate yours however you'd like. And we'll just do a few little hearts. So this is a Christmas pie after all. It's made with a lot of love and it's made to really nourish the people who get to enjoy it. We're not talking about roasted cauliflower here, folks. This is, this is real food. Just two things left to do now before this very special pie goes into the oven. We need to brush it with a little bit of egg wash and then cut a few slits at the top so that all that steam that builds up inside as that meat is getting nice and hot can be let out. There are certain dishes when you make them, it means more than the sum of its parts for the people that you make them for. I remember this distinctively the first time I ever had gnocchi and I realized that every single one was shaped by hand. So if somebody makes you gnocchi, it means they love you. And I feel like when somebody takes the time to make fresh pastry and render down that beautiful, otherwise, you know, not so glamorous cut of meat into something that's absolutely wonderful, it means they love you. Into the oven she goes. So there you have it, a very special homemade Christmas meat pie. This dish means a lot to me and it means so much to the family when it's on the table. I hope you enjoy. If you would like the exact recipe, make sure you're subscribed to the free newsletter. There's a link to that below the video. And there's also going to be a link to Porter Road so that you can check out their beautiful selection of meats. And I'm also going to put the link to that article that I'd love for you to check out. Lots going on in the notes today. I hope this video has inspired you to make something delicious and special, and most importantly, handmade this season. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.